Good morning, church. How many's ready for the word? All right, we're in the last chapter of James. Last chapter, James chapter 5. So we have this morning and next week, we will finish up chapter 5. Next week is a special Sunday. Uh, Brother Elder, Elder Joe is going to be bringing the word to end this series out in James. And at the end of the service, we're going to have a special um, anointing service, laying down of hands. You know, in the scripture, it talks about that in James. And so we're going to do that. Uh, they're going to be bringing some anointing oil from Israel. And we're going to do that next week. And you're like, well, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that's all about. Get here next Sunday. He's going to explain it all. And we're going to have a powerful time in the Lord. How many would say that I will be in prayer for next Sunday service? How many would say that this week you would just say a prayer for next Sunday service, that the Lord would move and have his way and speak to you special? I believe God to do that every single week. But next Sunday, I'm, I'm really uh, keyed in on that because of what the scripture talks about with the laying on the hand. So uh, we're believing God to move next week. Amen? Amen. Amen. So don't miss that. Hallelujah. So in chapter one, James talks about a living faith in trials and temptations. And really throughout James, he's talking about having a living faith. I am every step that I make during the week, I am having faith in God and I'm living it. I'm not just talking about it. I'm actually living it. I believe what I'm saying and I live in faith always, no matter what. In chapter 2, a living faith in the life of the church. Chapter 3, warnings and words to teachers. But also we talked about the uh, untamable tongue and wisdom. And then chapter 4, the humble dependence of a true faith. James talks about don't be independent from God. We have to rely on God every single day no matter what. Amen? Amen. So having a humble dependence on God. And he cautions us against having an attitude that has, uh, that's independent. Like, in other words, I'm trusting in my things that I have and what I think and how I do. No, no, no. We've got to put our faith and trust solely in God. And he challenges us in the very last verse of chapter 4 to live according to what we know in the Lord. And what we know... When we learn something from God, we need to live according to that. We don't want to shove it aside just because we may not like it. How many's ever heard me say, I didn't write it? You know, I didn't. There's lots of things in there that we may not like in our flesh that we're like, oh, I would love to do that or I'd like to do this or that. But the word of God, when it says something, it's for our benefit. You know, I've taken back and I've, I've told the story before about my youngest uh, or my oldest, Joshua, when he was really young. You know, we said, hey, don't get up there looking at those cookies on the cookie sheet. Don't do that. He couldn't wait. I mean, because it was hot. They need to cool. They need to set. But he, anyways, well, we weren't trying to hold him back from the cookie. We're like, it's going to come. You're going to get your cookie. How many like cookies? How many can taste cookies right now? Because you just, you heard the word cookie. Yes, they were chocolate chip, homemade Mm, thank you, Lord. So, it, you know, we're like, hey, he knew what those had tasted like before, and he wanted it again. So he couldn't wait, and it was up there. on the. So he put his hand on the counter and went like that to look at the cookie. He just wanted to look. And that pan, we're like, no, no, no. And sh- sure enough, that pan right there burned him right there on the edge. So now he's crying forever, you know, just crying on and on because it's burning. So when the cookie, of course, you know, the cookie helps with the tears, of course, right? Because the cookie tastes good, but we weren't trying to, you know, take away his fun. We weren't trying to tell him he couldn't have the thing that he was wanting. We were giving him instructions on how to not get hurt. Giving him instructions on how to wait and to be patient. And today we're going to talk about being patient. And for him, now when you're two years old, okay, and you're waiting for the cookies to cool, that's a trial, church. That's a trial for a two-year-old. Okay, I know because I was there. When my mama made me Rice Krispie treats or or cookies, and I had to wait, I could smell it because you can smell it, 
and it's like you can taste it, but it's not, it's not the same just smelling it. you got to have it. It's a trial when you're little, right? And he had to learn to be patient and patiently wait for it. And so chapter 5 is the life of a living faith. And so we'll talk about that patience. But first, first, in the first six verses, James gives a rebuke of the ungodly rich. And so we're going to look at it. But before we do, let's pray. Father, this morning we thank you for your word. I thank you what you're speaking to us here today. I thank you that we could humble ourselves before you and say that we need to be patient in all things. And Father, I thank you that all distractions will be gone and that we could just focus on you in this time and your voice here today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. In the first three verses, James is talking about the rich and the illusion of wealth. And he starts in verse 1 and he says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Now, look at verse 1 again where he says, Come now, you rich. And he says, Weep and howl. For your miseries, these miseries are coming upon you. <laughs> and that doesn't sound all that great. And it sounds like James is really against the rich or being rich or having wealth. And there's other spots in the scripture where it seems like having wealth or being rich, oh, that's a bad thing, you know. It can seem that way. But the problem isn't the money. The problem is relying on the money. Remember, James, just we just came off the scriptures in chapter 4 where he's talking about don't be independent from God. Don't live independent from God. In other words, don't put all your trust in money. Don't put your trust in your things and in your wealth. Trust in God. And see, here's what he says in at verse 1, he's rebuking those who are the most likely to live independent from God. It's the rich. Now, you've got to understand that Jesus counted some rich persons among his followers. You, you, Zacchaeus, Joseph of uh, Arimathea, Barnabas. And, uh, but the thing is, is that riches present an additional, additional and if I'm going to read this in my notes right, and significant obstacle to the kingdom. Now, what does that mean? That just means if I'm rich, it's easier for me to trust in those riches rather than trust in God. See, riches and money is not my source. God is my source. Now, money's a good thing. It's a very good thing for us to have because we need it. We need it for our food. We need it for shelter. We need it for the clothes that we're wearing. We need it for things. It's a necessity. And it's just that. Money is a necessity. We need to view it as a necessity. And what did Jesus say? That he would supply all our needs, the necessities, according to his riches and glory. And I believe that there's also another component to wealth. There's another component to riches. When we see ministries or we see those that are Christians who are millionaires or whatever, they're able to do things to help those that don't have what they have. And so they're able to bring them up. Amen. Uh, amen. amen. And so if you're like, well, I've got a good amount of money. Thank God you do. And I, you know, I'm driving in this nice car. What am I supposed to do about that? Well, you're supposed to thank God for it. Give it all over to God. Not give it all away. Give it to Him. Like, God, this all belongs to you. I am a steward of it and allow Him to guide you in the use of those funds. Now, if you're without and maybe you need more, again, where, is your, where does your provision come from? It comes from God. So therefore, I trust, I begin to put my trust 
in him to provide. And he makes the way. Now, does that mean I say, God, I trust you that I'm going to have the money for this and that's and this and that's and all my this and that's and this and that's. And then we sit down and we just watch TV. Uh-uh. See, I got, I, I've had people over the years, they get real spiritual with certain things. And they'll say, oh, well, God's going to bring me a job. And then they go sit down. Mm, see, they, they, they throw out a lot of other scriptures. Like, see, he blesses the work of your hands. See, the Jews worked. The Jewish people in the Old Testament, when you look and you see how they viewed work, if you weren't working, <laughs> you were looked down upon. And if you were working, that meant you were blessed. That's how they viewed work. They viewed it that way. And so those, and they believed that God would bless the work of their hands. Because why? Because God said he would. And so therefore, they put their hands to the plow. What does that mean for us for today and today? Well, I don't have a job or I don't have money. I don't have this. Okay, let's give that over to God and say, God, I think you're going to lead and guide me to do what I need to do. And you say, well, if God's not speaking at that moment, I'm going to do what I know that I can do until he speaks and tells me to do something different. So what does that mean? If you don't have a job, start applying for a job. Don't sit back on the couch waiting for a job to supernaturally fall in your lap. Because guess what? It's not going to happen. I have seen those individuals. God's going to bring me an opportunity and bring me a job. And they don't do anything to put themselves in a position for it to come. God's going to bless the work of your hand, even if it's just picking up a pen and filling out an application and, you know, and turning it in. Or nowadays, we don't write them anymore. We're a pen, right? We just do it online. You apply, everything's, everything's online. Anyways... I believe you get the point. In Matthew 19, 24, it says, And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. In 1 Timothy 6, 10, he says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Mm. Matthew Poole, he says this. He said, he speaks to them not simply as rich, for riches and grace sometimes may go together. That's what we talked about. If you, God leading you to bring somebody else up, to help somebody else, to use the, the money for the kingdom of God, for the furtherment of his kingdom. But as wicked, not only wallowing in wealth, but abusing it to pride, luxury, oppression, and cruelty. See, that's what James is talking about. Those rich that love their money and trusting in that money and the love of money is the root of all evil. Church, we see that in our world. It's very easy to see. We could sit here and talk a, a, a long time about the world systems. We could talk about just even just the pharmaceutical company. How many knows they're crooks? And who's enabling them? Our government. Why? Because of the lobby. I mean, we can go on and on. And why is it? Because those that are sitting in Congress are getting a piece. It's all about the money. Church, it's just there. I'm not trying to, that's not conspiracy. That's just fact. It doesn't take a genius to figure it out. These are the things we see in our world. And, and, and it's why you see in some countries, people go out of the country to get medication because they can't afford it here. Because why? There's some men that are in love with money so much that they don't care about you or me or those around, and they're oppressing. Now, are they all like that? Are all pharmaceutical companies like that? Are all the people who work for them like that? No, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying in general, that industry is really corrupt. It's just period. It's really corrupt, and it's very sad when you can go to Canada and get the same medication four times less. Sometimes... Seven, eight, I'm not kidding, times less. But yet Americans are paying way over that for some of these medications. Why is that? 1 Timothy 6.10, one more time. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And don't think God's not going to judge that. 
Why? Because in verse 3, let's read it one more time. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you. A witness against you. That corruptible nature of the wealth of the rich, rich will be a witness against them. When they stand before God, it's going to be revealed that they had their lives. They were arrogantly independent from God. They were in love with money and they oppressed others because of it. It will be a witness to them, against them. Mm. See, so many times we as, uh, you know, I, I have always considered myself, I'm a, per, I, I'm a justice person. I, I cannot stand it when somebody's getting oppressed or somebody's getting a raw deal or whatever it may be. I just, I, I just don't like it. I don't like it when people get off, you know, when they've done something really, really bad, they need to pay for that. That's just how I am, church. That is my nature, okay? And when I read this in verse 3, and I read this, I read that my God is a just God. That's what I read. That's what I read. And see, understand when he says, a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire, you have heaped up treasure in the last days. Now, this last days, it's a phrase that means since his resurrection. He's not talking about something that hasn't happened yet or we're living in just the last days now. No, the last days started the day after or the day of that Jesus rose from the grave. Okay, so this has been going on since then. James is addressing something in the church that was going on right then and there. The rich were oppressing people. And it was happening then. And guess what? Nothing's changed, church. The rich still oppress today. And does that mean, again, I, I, I want to be careful here because I don't want to tell you or give you the impression that money is bad. Money's good. I could use a little bit more of it. How many in here could say me too? All right? All right. It's not that money's bad. It's the love of money, putting it before God, trusting in it, being independent from God and saying, my money's enough. Well, guess what? Your money's not enough. And if you really break it down, you start talking to some of those people who feel that way and they're all, I'm good, I'm good. They're actually miserable. Hey, just look at the tabloids and the celebrities and all that mess. They got all these millions of dollars. Oh my goodness. That's why, you know what I'm just remembering? Millionaire, right? Millionaire playing for a professional football team. But he gets caught stealing at a store. Makes sense. Please make sense of that. Make sense of that. Do you know why? Because his money's not enough. He had to have a thrill or something because his life was not fulfilled with just the money. See, we get in this mindset, we're like, oh, well, if I just had this money or I get that, oh, I'm going to be, it's not enough, church. You got to have more than that. You got to have more than that. It's not just the money. I mean, when I looked at that headline and I saw that, and then they started talking about it on my sports show, I, I watch first takes sometimes and I'll fast forward through it. I'll record it and watch it later, you know. I don't watch it all, but I watch some of it. And that, that headline, I was, I was floored. I was like, what? That guy did what? He went to the store and stole something. He's a millionaire. Why is he stealing this? What is, it made no sense to me. But then I started thinking about, wait, wait, the money's not enough. It's not enough. He needed God. He needed God in his life. And that's when we need to take the moment. We need to take a moment. We need to pray. See, when so many, we, we, despite, you know, James, and you can see, you can probably sense a little bit of his attitude towards these people because he's a just person as well, and he, he's a justice. But let me tell you, Jesus said we've got to pray for our enemies. And so even though these, these are the, we've got to pray for the oppressors even. That's hard to do, but that's what we've got to do. In verse 4, it says, Indeed, the wages of the labors who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived in the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in, the, in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Now look at this in verse 4. You have kept back by fraud the wages of the labors. 
They withheld. The rich were withholding pay to their laborers. They were putting it off, maybe paying them later, maybe not paying them as much. They were taking advantage of their workers. They lived indulgently. They didn't have any regard for others. You know, it's kind of like that, uh, the man in Jesus' story about the rich man and Lazarus. It, they condemned and murdered from their position of power. You've got these, these people. These are the things they were doing. Matthew Poole says this, deferring payment is a sort of defrauding as it bereaves the creditor of the benefit of improvement. And so they are taxed here with injustice as well as covetousness in that they lived upon other men's labors and starved the poor to enrich themselves. It's just wrong. And so these are the kind of injustices that James is speaking out on. And he's saying, we can't, no. And then when you look and you see, the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Now, the Lord of Sabaoth should not be confused with that similar title, the Lord of Sabbath. Okay, it's not Sabbath. Used in, uh, this is used, you'll see this, this phraseology in Mark 2, 28, Luke 6, 5. The translation is Lord of hosts, which means the Lord of armies, especially in the sense of heavenly, angelic armies. It describes God as the warrior, the commander-in-chief of all heavenly armies. Let me read this from my notes. The use of this title was meant to give these unjust rich people a sober warning. The cries of the people they had oppressed had come to the ears of the God who commands heavenly armies, the God of might and power and judgment. James Adam, Adamson says this, the primary reference is to Yahweh as the God of hosts or the armies of Israel and later the host of heaven. The rabbis rarely use the title, but Exodus 3, 6 connects it with Yahweh's war against injustice. Church, I am thankful that I serve a just God who sees all, nobody's getting away with it. You know, I, we'll look and we'll see that so-and-so's getting away with this or getting away with that. They're not. They're not. God's going to deal with it. Amen. In verse 6, it says, you have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. What does that mean? Often those that are poor, without power, they get little satisfaction from judgment and they really can't resist because they're not in a position to resist. And they get run over. But yet God hears their cries. That's what James is saying. God hears them. And he is the one who guarantees to ultimately right every single wrong that these oppressors have done. Now, verses 7 through 12. A call for patient endurance in light of the coming judgment. And in verses 7 and 8, he says, imitate the patient endurance of the farmer. Now remember, he just got through talking about people who were being oppressed by the rich, those that were rich and, and abusing their power. Did everybody abuse their power? No, but many did, many did. And James was speaking out against that. And so these, he's speaking to these that are, they're in hardship. They're going through hardship. And he's saying, God's gonna take care of it. But then he says this, he says, therefore, See, in this verse 7, so we have to keep in light of what he's been talking about. In other words, they've been going through hardship because of the oppression. And he says this, therefore, be patient. Be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. This is really good because church, James is calling Christians, especially those enduring hardship, to patiently endure until the coming of the Lord. How many could say they've gone through some hardship this past year? Yeah, yeah, I think we all could put our hands up. And what he says is, be patient. Now that's not the easiest thing, especially when you're going through it at the moment. It's not easy because you're like, you're wanting it to be worked out. You want to do something about it. You want it to change. You're just, ah, ah. I know because I've been there. I've done that. 
But G. Campbell Morgan, he says this, sometimes indeed the very hope of the coming of the Lord has seemed to increase impatience rather than patience. Oh, to be patient in fellowship with God. See, he connects this with, he says, waiting patiently, okay, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So what he's saying there is have that fellowship with God. Just as this man was saying, oh, <laughs> what does he say? He says, oh, to be patient in fellowship with God. See, we're in fellowship with God now. So many, sometimes we can go through stuff and we're like, oh, I just wish the Lord would come back. This is just miserable right here. But he says, be patient. Be patient in your fellowship with God. Just begin to fellowship with him. Love on him. I guarantee as you begin to reach out to God, he is going to comfort you. He's going to bring you through that hardship. Is it going to be easy? Probably not. But man, when you just imagine, okay, I want you to imagine with me this morning, you're going through the hardship by yourself. That's horrible. Now imagine you're going through the hardship and God has his arm around you walking with you. How much better would that be? Uh, whatever the, the difficulty is, whether it's something in the family, something on the job, a financial difficulty, whatever it is you're believing God for or you're needing a miracle about, God can put his arm right around you. What we have to do is be patient in our fellowship with him and endure. So if we're going through that hardship, we've got to wait patiently. In verse 7, he also says, he said, how the farmer, and he uses the farmer as an example. The farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently. A farmer doesn't give up when his crop doesn't come to harvest immediately. What does he do? He plants the seed, he waters it, and he's got to wait. Now, back then, they planted the seed and they had to wait for rain to come. Okay? But see, Christians need to work hard just like a farmer and exercise patient endurance when it comes to... To, to, like, the, to the solution to whatever the hardship may be or that waiting on the Lord coming back again. I want to read right here out of my notes because when we think about it, the waiting and the need for endurance we have in the Christian life, it's very much like wait, the waiting of a farmer. And I want to read some of the uh, things about a farmer here and it's the same for us. He waits with a reasonable hope and expectation of reward. The farmer waits a long time. He waits working all the while. He waits depending on things out of his own power with his eye on the heavens. See, he can't make just that rain come whenever, right? He waits depending on the things that it's, it's out of his hands, it's out of his power and his eyes on the heavens. He waits despite changing circumstances and many uncertainties. He waits encouraged by the value of the harvest. He waits encouraged by the work and harvest of others. He waits because he really has no other option. He waits because it does no good to give up. He waits aware of how the seasons work. He waits because as time goes on, it becomes more important and not less to do so. You know, I was talking... I think I was, I was talking with Debbie before the service, and I said, you know, hey, she's like, how you doing? I'm, I'm doing great. I got things I could complain about, but I'm not gonna. She's like, yeah, what good would that do, right? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What good would it do? I've got to patiently endure whatever hardship that I might be going through or whatever the things that, that's happened. We all have to patiently endure in our fellowship, though, with God, we don't stop working. We don't stop praying. We don't stop being in the Word. We've still got to do what we know to do. But we put that patience hat on. In that phrase, the phraseology, until it receives the early and latter rain, this is the picture of the early and latter rain that the farmers, you know, in early, uh, the rains come in late October or early November, and they would soften the ground for the plowing and the latter rains coming in late April or May. And that was essential for the maturing of the crops shortly before harvest. This is not talking about the latter, early and latter rain of Joel and Acts and things like that. This is to be taken literally in, in terms of farming, okay? So 
If you are familiar with that phraseology, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, just ignore that and just know that we're talking about farming. Can I get an amen? All right. <laughs> James Moffat says the farmer had to wait for this rainfall twice in the year, but although he could do nothing to bring it, he did not lose heart, provided that he was obeying the will of his God. Mm, that's good. Obeying the will of God. We, as long as we're in obedience with God, we're listening to what the Spirit's saying, what the Spirit is leading and guiding every step of the way throughout our week, that's what we're supposed to do. That's it. And we won't lose heart, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. I, I want to say this real quick before we move on to the next verse. The coming of the Lord is at hand. When James wrote this, the coming of the Lord was at hand. At that moment. That second, he was putting pen to paper. Matter of fact, the coming of the Lord was at hand before he put pen to paper. Now, I'm not sure what your definition of at hand is. I don't even know what mine is at this point. Because when I look at it, I got a big fat, I don't know. The coming of the Lord is at hand now. The coming of the Lord was at hand a thousand years ago. I want you to think about something with me. You know, when we said, we, he already taught, he said the phraseology, the last days. The last days from the time, like I said before, from the resurrection until now. I want you to think about the time before Christ. How long was it? How many years was it? Can I get a shout? Somebody want to shout? How many years before Christ? Do we know exactly? We really don't know. But what we can say is that it was way more than the time that we have had after Christ. So in other words, B.C., you know, you got the B.C. and the A, A, A.D. or whatever, you know, right? Okay, so before Christ, that's what the B.C. is supposed to be for. I don't know. They tried to change it. I don't know if they did, whatever. All I know is the before Christ is like three or four times at least longer than the time frame that we have had since Christ was born on the earth. I'm just, I'm being conservative there, okay? All right, because in all likelihood, it was probably even more than that. So when it says the last days, when Christ came, it was like, these are the last days. It's, it's going to be less, I believe, than what's before. That's the inference there. However, it still can be a long time. So we need to be patient for the coming of the Lord. And I want you to also understand something here with this. I, I, I am looking forward to the coming of the Lord. Will I be disappointed if the Lord doesn't come back in my lifetime? I will not. I've made up my mind not to be. Okay? But I am looking for his return because that's what the scripture does. What does that do? It gives me hope. I have faith in that. That's why James is writing it. He's saying, You've endured all this hardship. This is the good part, church, right here. You're being oppressed by the rich. You've got them holding back your wages and all of that. You've gone and you've labored, and there's all this injustice happening to you because of these oppressive rich people. And all you've got to do, though, is remember how good and how just your God is. He sees it all. He's going to judge it all. And remember, he's coming back for you. Because he loves you with an everlasting love. And he either comes back for you, split in the skies as they say or whatever, or he comes back for you after your physical body dies. He's coming back either way. That I can guarantee you 100%. If you have given your life over to God, you will see him. However it is, it's okay with me. It's fine with me. Did that help somebody? Amen. Verse 9. Do not, see, this is the practicing patient, uh, patient endurance here. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Now, what does he say this for? Why am I, you know, I grumble at my neighbor? Well, because look. When you're going through something, like, I, let's take chronic pain for an example. If you're in chronic pain, it's not easy to not snap at somebody, okay? 
It's just not because you, I mean, you're feeling something right then and there all the time or whatever it may be. You're in pain. It hurts. And somebody else comes and they may be, it may be an innocent thing. They just came and they said a little something, but boy, you just got, you know. And it could be, it could be something else. It may not be. It may be something else that it had just hit you and this bill came and you didn't know about it or whatever it may be. Or you looked out your window because you heard a big crash and somebody smacked your car out there on the curb and it's all dented in. And then somebody right after that, because you're still not happy about that, has come to you and saying something and you're just, wah, 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 you know, we can be that way. When we're going through hardship, it's easy to grumble against your brother in the Lord. It's easy to grumble at a family member, even easier there. Why? Because of the familiarity. So we can grumble. And so what is he saying? Hey, despite this hardship, that doesn't mean you get to be less loving with your Christian brothers and sisters. You still have to love them anyways. Don't be grumblers and complainers in your hardship, lest we be condemned even in our hardship. Because the judge is standing at the door. Amen? And also there, when he says, behold, judge is standing at the door, just know, hey, all those oppressors and all those things, again, God's going to deal with that. He's dealing with all that. We don't have to. Verse 10 and 11, following examples of patient endurance. My brother, my brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You who have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Mm. So he says, take the prophets. See, James reminds us that the prophets in the Old Testament, they endured hardship, yet they practiced patient endurance. We can take those examples and we can learn from them. You could look at like Jeremiah as one example. He endured a lot of mistreatment. But he did it with patience. He was put in the stocks. He was thrown into prison. He was lowered into a miry dungeon. Yet he persisted in his ministry. Matthew Poole says this, As much as God honored and loved them, yet they were not exempted from afflictions, but were maligned, traduced. Traduced meaning, you know what that, that means? Their reputation. They were slandered, and they didn't have a good reputation because of their slander. And they were persecuted by men. And therefore, when they suffered such hard things, it's no shame for you to suffer the like. That's good. And we've got to realize that despite what we're going through, somebody's already went through something even harder. And they did it with patience. And so James is saying, hey, patiently endure. And he uses the example of Job in verse 12. Despite all the trials that Job was put through, James concludes that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful to Job. I'm going to read this from my notes. By the end of Job's story, we see that God had accomplished something wonderful to make Job a better and more blessed man than ever. Remember that as good as Job was at the beginning of the book, he was a better man at the end of it. He was better in character, humbler, and more blessed than before. So see, God, no matter what it is and no matter how bad it looks like, and trust me with Job, when you go read the story of Job, he lost it all. He lost it all. It was rough. Okay, but the example there is for us to learn from. The example is for us to look and see that, hey, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. It may be dark right now, but if we keep our eyes on Jesus, that light's going to get brighter and brighter and bigger and bigger. Amen? Amen. And that's just something we have to remember as we go through. Now, verse 12, it's an exhortation in the light of the coming judgment for Jesus. It's our last verse we're going to cover this morning. He says, but above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. Now, do not swear. Many Jewish people, in the, and this is not talking about swearing in terms of profanity. That's not what he's talking about here. Many Jewish people in the time that James wrote made distinctions between binding oaths and non-binding oaths, oaths that did not Oaths that, that, that did not include the name of God were considered non-binding. binding, And to use such oaths, oaths was a way of like crossing your fingers behind your back kind of thing, you know? All right, when you were telling a lie. It's these kind of oaths that James were, that, that he was condemning. The Bible doesn't forbid the swearing of all oaths only against the swearing of deceptive, unwise, and flippant oaths. And when see people are trying to do that, 
it's because their character is low enough to where they have to go, oh, I, I swear, I, I, I promise, I promise, you know. Well, they haven't been trustworthy. And he's saying, don't do that. Don't act this way. It doesn't matter what you're going through, what's going on. You don't need to do that. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Let's all stand. Church, I want us to go back. to verse, if you guys can find this on there for me again, um, verse 7 and verse 8. Are those on the screen at the same time? I don't know if they are. Let's, let's start with 7 though. Okay. Therefore, be patient. Everybody say, be patient. Be patient. See, this is what we got to tell ourselves. We have to tell ourselves, be patient. Despite whatever the hardship is, whatever it is that we're happy, what's going on, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth, waiting patiently, there it is again, for it until he receives the earth early in the latter rain. Now let's go look at verse eight. Here we go. You also be patient. Everybody say, be patient. Because there it is again. See, it's multiple times that he's saying it. And so what that tells me is I've got to tell myself multiple times that despite whatever it is that I'm going through, as hard as it is, I got to tell myself, I've got to speak to my soul and say, soul, be patient and have that fellowship with God. Have that fellowship. I've got to establish my heart before Him, patiently waiting for the coming of the Lord. The way to be patient, to be successfully patient, is to be in fellowship with God. Constant fellowship with God. It's the only way I know to be patient. I can tell you that by nature, I'm an impatient person. I get that from my father, I think. I think we both, sometimes patience leaves us. He has said it before, so I'm not telling anything. He has it, but he does really good. Why does he do good though with it? Because of the Lord. Because of the Lord. I worked on it. He, he taught me scriptures, told me what he did. I mean, we're talking years and years ago. Told me what to do. So I started doing that. I got better and better. Do I still mess up? Oh, yes. Especially when I'm dealing with some hardship. And see, I think that's specifically what James is talking about. These people were oppressed. They were going through a hardship. I mean, hardship like really, honestly, we, we just probably don't know much about. Because then, I mean, people were getting away with so much stuff, it's, it's unreal. Most of society back when, when the, in the early church was more corrupt than what it is now. We have the same type of corruption, but it was just worse back then when you go and study and read, when you really look at it. Times, and especially for us here in America, we're blessed. Church, we're blessed. That's right. Oh man, we're blessed. But see, God, He wants us, despite whether we feel blessed or not, whether we're going through something or not, He wants us to be in fellowship with Him patiently waiting for his return. And so this morning, what I believe that we need to do is respond to this message and respond to these verses that James has, that he's written, saying to be patient. And we respond by saying to the Lord, Lord, number one, I'm saying to you, I want to be patient in all things. Through all the things I'm going through, I want to be patient. And number two, now God, I need your help. I think that's humbling yourself before the Lord, as James also talked about. And we humble ourselves and we draw near to Him, right? And I said, God, I need your help. And see, I had to do that years ago when it came to, you know, being impatient. And I still, from time to time, I have to say, Lord, Forgive me for being impatient right there. And Lord, help me. Give me the strength 
to be patient, to speak kind and loving to my family, to speak kind and loving to others, to not get frustrated with others. Because see, that's the trap of the enemy. He wants to trap us in being frustrated and being frustrated because when we're doing that, we're not hearing from God and we're not able to do the things that God wants us to do, which is to love others as ourselves. So number one, let's just say to God, God, I, I'm willing to be patient. I want to be patient. I need to be patient. And then number two, Lord, I need your help in doing it. Can we do that this morning? And if you're like me and, and you know you need this because I, I, I need this. I needed this this week, looking at this, okay? If you're like me and you need patience, raise your hand with me. All right, now that's up to God. God sees that hand. Let's keep that right there and let's pray to him right now. Father God, Lord, this morning, I thank you that your word is powerful. It's mighty. And it has told me to be patient. And Lord, I want to be patient. I'm saying that to you now. And I believe that you would not have told me to do something that I'm not able to do. So Lord, I'm asking for your help. And Lord, I thank you that you give me the strength to be patient. Lord, I'll do my part. I'll draw near to you. I'll humble myself before you and submit myself unto you in all things. Lord, I thank you for your leading and your guiding. Lord, we're not going to grumble. We're not going to complain. We're especially not going to grumble and complain against our brothers and sisters in the Lord as your word has shown us this morning. Forgive us when we've complained about others. Forgive us when we've been impatient towards others and we've snapped when we shouldn't have snapped. Lord, we turn, we, we choose to repent of that right now and we choose to think different. We choose to believe that we can be patient even through hardship because you, you are God. You are supreme above all, and you can help us. So, Father, I thank you now. And I thank you for everyone under the sound of my voice. Lord, that we're going to be a testimony to others because that's how patient we're going to be. It's going to be a testimony to others. And they're going to see it and go, how do you do that? Lord, I thank you that you're using me. As I'm being patient, you're using me to reach others just with that example right there. Lord, I'm going to be on the job this week, and I'm going to be patient, and people are going to see it. And I'm going to be patient the next week and the week after that. And I'm going to continue to patiently wait on you as you work through all of the things with me that I'm going through. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand? He is good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.